Hi guys, welcome back. It's time for lessons 21 and 22. Um, this is the scanning tunneling microscope and other applications of tunneling and barrier penetration and so on. But actually, before we get into the barrier penetration business, I want to point out something about the double delta function potential we studied during the uh, second GR. So you've got a double delta function potential. You guys remember what the solutions looked like. One was a hyperbolic cosine internally and hyperbolic sine. That's the symmetric and anti-symmetric version. And uh, on the right and the left, of course, are the decreasing and increasing uh, exponentials. And uh, you no doubt remember the transcendental equation for each of those. The symmetric case had the hyperbolic tangent and the anti-symmetric case had the hyperbolic cotangent. I wanted to describe for you guys a strategy for actually solving these transcendental equations and getting values for the energy. So in order to do that, sort of the same way we did with the infinite, or excuse me, the finite square well, I want to introduce a parameter z and a parameter z0, which are just unitless numbers, which you can see uh, are easily uh, discovered in these equations if you multiply both sides by, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a over 2 you'll see that the hyperbolic tangent and cotangent equations reduce to these. Um, and if you graph those equations, let's see, if you graph 1 over 1 plus the hyperbolic tangent, you get the green line, and 1 over 1 plus the hyperbolic cotangent, you get the uh, red line. And then, of course, if you go back and look at those equations, you'll realize that those each have to be equal to z over z0. So again, we get a straight line z over z0, similar to what we had last time. You compute z0, it's easy to draw that line, and you can see the solutions, um, especially in the limit that z0 becomes large, you can see the solutions are gonna be right around z equals 1 half. But um, the interesting thing is that um, the red line gives you a higher energy solution than the green line. And the reason for that is uh, remember that the energies are negative, and so a larger value of z corresponds to a more negative energy, and that corresponds to a lower energy. Um, remember what the energy turned out to be. If you go back to the Schrodinger equation, you can see that the energy goes something like minus kappa squared. If you solve for the energy, it's minus h bar kappa quantity squared over 2m. And so the bigger kappa is, the more negative the energy. And of course, if you look back, <coughs> excuse me, if you look back, you can see that uh, the weight cap is defined. That means that um, the bigger z is, the more negative the energy. Anyway, uh, the other interesting thing you could see here is that the uh, symmetric solution always has an energy that's lower than a half, or more negative than a half, and uh, and the anti-symmetric had a higher energy. If you look at the variation of the energy with separation, you can see that as the two, as A gets larger, the slope of that line gets smaller and smaller, and both of the solutions approach a half, but it turns out um, the infinite separation corresponds to a reference point the anti-symmetric solution, the energy is always greater than the infinite separation solution, and the symmetric case is always lower than the infinite separation solution. So we call the symmetric wave function a bonding wave function, and the anti-symmetric function a anti-bonding wave function, an anti-bonding wave function. So um, one of them would produce a bond, and the other one would not produce a bond. In other words, if you're in the upper energy state, that would tend to produce repulsion between the two delta functions. If you're in the symmetric state, that would tend to produce attraction. So the variation with separation, if you were, I can't, it's not that easy to create a, uh, a graph of that because I'd have to write some kind of program that would solve the transcendental equations for different values of separation and then graph the energy. But that would make a nice final project. You can imagine in a real world scenario, there might also be another force between the two delta functions that would be repulsive as they got closer together. And uh, so in the bonding case, there would be a, an, uh, what would you call it, competition 
between the bonding nature of the symmetric wave function, which would reduce the energy as they got closer, and whatever repulsive potential was involved that would increase the energy as they got closer, and the, the uh, competition between those two would produce some kind of equilibrium separation. And that's exactly the same kind of physics that goes on with uh, a diatomic molecule. And we'll delve into that much more deeply next semester. But uh, you could do it right now with delta function potential, and uh, I think it would make a nice little project. So if you're looking for something to do for your final project, that's, uh, that's one you might consider. All right. <clears throat> if I have a hunk of metal next to a vacuum, um, we talked in class about the fact that that would produce a potential. Inside the metal, there's like a finite potential well. Outside the metal, there's a... <coughs> excuse me, a higher potential. And so you end up with a situation where electrons are stuck in the metal. There's a work function they have to overcome to escape from the metal. But if I bring another hunk of metal nearby, there's going to be a region in between the two uh, metal pieces where uh, the potential is high, but, um, but not infinite. And so it's possible for electrons to tunnel from one side to the other. Now, in the case of uh, just regular old metal, it, it turns out that the, uh, there's no advantage to the electron to tunnel over there because the states are all occupied on the other side. Uh, and so not much tunneling happens if you just bring two pieces of metal close to one another. However, if you apply a potential difference, that tends to bend the potential band uh, down on the right, say, for example. And what that produces is an empty place on the right for the electrons to go. And also, um, it makes a variable potential barrier that the electrons have to penetrate. And the degree of penetration um, depends on the distance over which the barrier exists and the, and the difference in potential. But you can see that uh, you could turn this into an a elementary quantum mechanics problem where you have to compute the penetration probability based on the shape of that potential. So how do we attack a problem like that? As we talked about in class, um, you can break the variable potential into a series of finite square barriers. And that'll generate a series of equations that you can use to solve by satisfying the slope and continuity boundary conditions at each boundary of each barrier. But it's a, it's a very large linear algebra problem. A uh, simpler approach is just to neglect the uh, growing part of the exponential and just look at the decaying part and we'll formalize this uh, much more clearly when we study the WKB approximation in chapter 8 the uh, next semester but for now just uh, you can just take the strategy and run with it uh, you can compute the probability the I should say you compute the amplitude to get through by calculating a position dependent value for Kappa and then integrate that across the region in which the potential energy is greater than the total energy. And you can come up with an amplitude to penetrate the barrier. And of course, then to get the probability, all you have to do is square it. So that's the idea. We can use that to calculate penetration probabilities for scanning tunneling microscopes, for nuclear reactions, and uh, lots of other interesting situations. Next time, I'll get you guys at the board doing uh, just such a calculation so you can see kind of how it turns out. Anyway, that's all I have for you this time, and we'll talk again next time.